Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing. I'm joined by my co-host, as always, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everybody. On today's show, we have another special guest with us on the phone. And um, if I was to ask you the question, who has been the music director for Ringo Starr and his all-star band more than anybody else, it would be our special guest, who is Mark Rivera. Hi, Mark, and welcome to Things We Said Today. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Steve. It's good to be on. We have Mark on the phone with us because he has a brand new CD that he's released and it's called Common Bond, and uh, I've already interviewed Mark privately, and so has Steve, actually, in the past. In fact, he's, yeah. uh, he's uh, written a review recently in Beatles Examiner for, for the new album. We both have been raving about it, and uh, we just want to talk for a while about the new album and uh, find out how long, how long have you been working on this album? Uh, let me see. I'm 61, so about 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite uh, sixty. It, 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 the, the actual project took about a year, a little over a year, to finalize. Uh, and then with distribution, we waited till we had the right group of people. Uh, but I mean, I wrote one of the songs with Jimmy Braylauer, my my producer and co-writer, probably twenty six years ago. When I did Sledgehammer with Peter Gaber, we we wrote a song, the song um, "Hard to Let Go." We wrote that trying to have that kind of a mood. So that goes back, uh, I think I, I think I did the uh, So Album 86. Mm. It was probably written in 87, maybe 88. So that's a couple of years. Yeah. Before we continue, uh, I, I really should give, you, give our listeners more of a background on you, because I only mentioned Ringo, but you have such an impressive resume. Uh, you go back to touring with Sam and Dave, as yeah, you told yeah. me. Uh, you were in... Do. Yeah. Foreigner, you were in the band for how many years? About uh, on and off between different tours, probably from 1980 till about 1994, I think, was the last date that I played with them. Yeah. Yeah, so 14 years on and off. Right. Yep. Of course, most people outside of the Beatle fans, and many of the Beatle fans, know you for your work with Billy Joel. That's been going on for quite a while, 32 years now. That is, in and of itself, a story. <laughs> that, that really is. Congratulations, Mark. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. In fact, uh, Billy is currently doing, uh, they're releasing, I believe in May, the Bridge box set DVD and uh, our tour of Russia. And that's the place in 1987. And I am the last remaining member of the band from that, from that tour, which wow. I'm proud of. Saddened by some, I mean, uh, the fact that, that Doug is gone and some very dear friends but are not there, but I'm proud to be uh, with Billy this long. Yeah, and currently doing a, a tour with him, and uh, you do have residency at Madison Square Garden once a month. Yeah. So, uh, yes, we do. At least I know, I'm comfortable knowing that you're always going to be in town near me. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I'm at your beck and call. <laughs> I'm, I'm nearby. Hey, you could be my co-host. I could be, you know. Then, then I'll have a real job. <laughs> <laughs> None of us have a real job. That's the truth. Well, that's the really exact point. Uh-huh. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about Jimmy Braylauer. He is the producer for the new album, and you've had a relationship with him for quite a long time. Give us a little background on him. Uh, Jimmy and I met uh, years ago. Uh, we played in a band called Trouble with this guy named Jimmy Frank. Jimmy and I did the whole scene in Manhattan. We worked about five or maybe five or seven different clubs constantly. We'd run around. Uh, he played drums. That was his gig originally. And then as time went on, he saw the handwriting on the wall with all the electronic music and the uh, sequencers. He was uh, one of the first people, if not the first person to beta test a Lynn drum machine. Uh, and he's got an extensive resume from, I um, mean, I could just, Took a couple of Stevie Winwood. Uh, he and I both played on 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 so on Peter Gabriel so 
He's worked with Eric Clapton. He's done, he's done tons of work with Nile Rodgers, hmm. Sheik, and all the uh, God. He did the uh, all the uh, Jim Steinman productions with uh, Meatloaf. I mean, it is. Uh, I mean, I can't even begin. Madonna. Let me see. Uh, Celine Dion, just to name a few. I feel like I'm dropping names, but Jimmy's background is is extensive, and uh, he and I had been friends forever. We'd always find each other, we'd walk past each other at the power station or at the hit factory or at the record plant. He'd be doing one record, I'll be doing another record. And uh, about two years ago, Jimmy said, hey, buddy, it's time for you to do your record. And I'm like, well, I don't know. He said, you've been saying I don't know for now over two decades. So he, it's his fault. I'm going to blame him for everything. So he basically <laughs> convinced me that I had a potential to, do, uh, to make a great record. And uh, thank, thank goodness I listened to him. And uh, I'm very proud of this. Hmm. Where did the name come from, Common Bond, Mark? Uh, Common Bond, to me, is the sense of the commonality I have in my musical background. Uh, some of the songs, I mean, first of all, I covered a Jimi Hendrix song. I covered a uh, Fleetwood Mac song. But my some of my favorite music from back in that day was uh, Traffic, which one of the songs, uh, Start Over, I think, is reminiscent of that. There's some R&B roots. There's some... It's a collection. What I have in common in the, the gathering of all my common uh, musical uh, genres, and the fact that I was able to ask very dear friends. Uh, I mean, I, I asked Billy Joel, I asked Ringo, I asked Mills Lofton, Steve Lukather, would you play on my record? And each one said yes. And there was a thread that just went through, and um, I just thought. Common Bond, and as it turns out, my son uh, was an architecture major at Virginia Tech, and he said, yeah, Dad, Common Bond, that's cool. That's how when people make a, a house, they, the bricklayers lay the brick off-center, and it's Common Bond, and it keeps it stronger. And I thought to myself, wow, that's even cooler. It's a, it's a sense <laughs> of making something to last. So it just seemed like a natural, natural thought for what I was hoping to create with this record. Who's on the album besides Ringo and Billy? There's the, the rhythm section is Charlie Drayton, who's played with a ton of people. Uh, and he's most he's well known for his work with uh, Keith Richards. He and Steve Jordan switched off between bass and drums. He played with Keith. He played with uh, Fiona Apple. He played with Paul Simon. Uh, he, he's a, a, he was the hardest guy to, to, to nail down for rehearsal, and, um, and, and as well as the um, the actual recording. But I'm very pleased that I waited this. Uh, Charlie Drayton, Steve Conti on guitar. He's played with the Dolls. He's played with Eric Burton. His brother John Conti, uh, Jeff Kazee played keyboards. And the one, of the, the other co-writer on a lot of the material is Johnny Gale. He was uh, the glue of a lot of the rhythm section stuff. Johnny and Jimmy had worked uh, together on a Ryan Shaw record for some time. I don't know if you're familiar with Ryan, but uh, aside from that, Will Lee played bass on one song. Robert Randolph played on a song. I'm um, trying to think if there's any. Uh, Catherine Sutton uh, sang backgrounds in one of the songs. Uh, I think I've named everybody. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, <laughs> just, to, just to name a few. And, of course, the, the, the co-writer Karen Mano, a great songwriter who wrote the beautiful closing song, Rise. So uh, that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> it's, it's such an impressive uh, lineup of musicians right there. I, I do want to say about uh, the production, I think it's just superb. I mean, what I, uh, apart from loving the songs, I think the mix is just so perfect because every, every uh, musician gets to shine at their own instrument when it's necessary. That's very, that's very kind of you to say, and quite frankly, I have to give complete, complete kudos to Jimmy Brailauer. He... I mean, I go in there and play a guitar part, and I go in there and play a sax part, and I go in and play I do a vocal or whatever I did, and I, hey, I got to go, got to go do a gig. And he'd work literally hundreds and hundreds of hours. I mean, I, I, I don't even want to tell you how many hours. He, if I, he might even say hundreds, more like a thousand. <laughs> uh, it was the true, truest labor of love. Um, I've never seen anyone so delve so deeply into a project. And um, he, he called me at, late at night, hey, buddy got another mix for you. And he'd have like five mixes of the song. And I'm like, what am I listening for? He goes, well, you didn't notice I took the guitar back here. But you're absolutely right, Ken. There, there are situations where you clear out a little bit of the sonic uh, area. So the frequencies would come through. And all of a sudden, you hear the Hammond B3 growl. 
or you hear that Barry Sachs come through. Uh, he gave clarity. Oh, and one more person, Andy York, uh, uh, John Mellencamp's guitarist, is also on the record. Just came to me because that was one of the things we had like six guitar different parts on this, different guitar parts, and he would just like clear the clutter. And uh, it's very kind of you, Sam. I'm going to make sure Jimmy hears you that you said that because he deserves all the credit for this. To say uh, to be, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going beyond humility. I'm going to direct fact. He did such an amazing job, and I thank you for that for that compliment. Oh, well, I, I really think he did a superb job. I got to ask you because you're someone who impresses me as somebody who has such a deep appreciation for a lot of different styles of music and so many, so many different types of musicians that are out there. Um, when it came to picking the cover songs, Spanish Castle Magic, Jimi Hendrix, and you also did uh, Tell Me All the Things You Do, Fleetwood Mac song, I'm you sure there's so, much, so many songs you'd love to cover. How did yes. you pick, how did you narrow it down to those two? Uh, Spanish Castle Magic, uh, as far as the raw energy of a song, is my favorite Jimi Hendrix song. Uh, as far as the philosophical point of Jimi Hendrix which people don't usually think about if six or nine is my favorite song and castles made of sand because it kind of says what you what you think is is not necessarily what is hmm. um, but as far as raw energy I love Spanish castle magic I saw Hendrix play that two or three different times in New York and I always wanted to play it as far as telling me all the things you do it was one of those songs I played in the band when I was in Brooklyn years ago and uh, that uh, the Fleetwood Mac album. Uh, Kiln, Kiln House. House is it? Kiln, I think it's Kiln, Kiln House, House, yeah. Kiln House, exactly. And I cover those songs. I did that one, Station Man, from that record. I just always dug this song, and it, it basically, it was an excuse to play, and it was the first song we cut to get the band flowing. And uh, that's how that, that all worked out. We also covered, uh, we tried to cover, and I'll say totally, um, I wanted to do Tomorrow Never Knows, because that's... Probably my favorite Beatles song and my favorite Beatles album is Revolver. Uh, and Ringo actually said that it was his as well, but I wasn't allowed to ever say that, but I just did, so he'll hang me down. <laughs> but uh, the, sound of, the sound of that record, to me, that's when um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Emmerich first recorded the Beatles. It was the first time he engineered any of the, the sessions. And the first song that he ever did, I'm sure you know this, was Tomorrow Never Knows. Right. <laughs> and it's just incredibly explosive. So we tried to cover that, and Jimmy Braylauer looked at me, he said, because yeah, we had a long take of it, we just played through it, he said, buddy, it's a real nice exercise, but you're never going to do what the Beatles did. So then I tried to do another cover of it, like playing this real detuned guitars and droning with Chasm and myself, and that was close, but it still never cut the mustard. So And then we tried, we covered, we did cut, and we may do it eventually, or on an, uh, uh, an EP, of It Don't Come Easy. It's kind of like... Uh, it's kind of like Ringo meets uh, Neil Young's uh, Cinnamon Girl. <laughs> but it's, it's just a different twist. But those songs, uh, to the, the short answer, it's, I mean, there's so much great music out there. And this band, I wanted to hear Charlie play Spanish Castle Magic. It's kind of like my own little, gee, I have Charlie Drake. What will I, what will I ask him to play? <laughs> yeah. I got to tell so, you, though, that's I, how that worked, yeah. I love the guitar playing from uh, Steve Conti. On tell me all the Steve things Conti's you do. He's a monster. You know, it's it's got such a great groove, that song. I well, I agree. I'll, that is a that, that's a, a wonderful cover. Wonderful. I'll, I, I thank you. And I'll, I'll tell you, talking about aggressive guitar, his solo on "Turn Me Loose" is one of the best. I mean, Steve Lukather heard that uh, about a year ago. He said, "Dude, who's that guitar player?" I'm a fan. He was like so into it. And I told Conti that. He goes, yeah, Stephen, I knew each other. Because he said he liked me. He's like, really? Again, these guys are all, we're all so, like, insecure. It, it, you know, it goes beyond humility. It's like, really, he liked it? So, <laughs> but uh, Steve's great. In fact, I have a gig coming up March 27th at the Cutting Room. And I'll be is, there. Uh, out of sight. Mm -hmm. Out of sight. And, and the band is going to be Steve Conti on guitar, Charlie Drayton on drums, uh, Johnny Gale is playing second guitar, or they're going to whoever's playing first or second guitar is irrelevant. The two, those two wonderful guitar players, Zeph Katz, bass player extraordinaire, is going to be playing bass, and my very dear friend from from ever ago, Bet Sussman, will be playing keyboards. And it's going to it's going to be a great. It, the band is like stellar, and uh, I'm really looking. Those are the five people I have like talk about herding cats to get them to, to figure out what we could rehearse. <laughs> yeah, that's but, uh, a smoking band right there. I can't wait to see it. 
I'm, 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 I can't wait to get. I can't wait to throw it down. <laughs> that's that's oh, that's going to be great. Let me ask a question, Mark, about about if we can talk about Ringo and the All Star Band. I know I asked uh, Edgar Winter this uh, question a couple of years ago, and, and uh, what kind of boss is Ringo as far as the All Star Band goes? Does does each man in the band have their choice of songs, or does Ringo pick them? How does that How does that work? Ringo, first and foremost, is the most fair human being I've ever met in my life. He, it's it's basically his his only criteria for picking songs is that they were hits. He'd like to play the hits that people know, but he also wants to play the songs that are fun for the particular band. And I kind of go in between, like, you know, the hit versus the... I mean, I, I'm a fan, and uh, I'll give you a perfect example. When Greg Lake was in the band, uh, Carnival 9 was a lock. Lucky Man was a lock, and I think he wanted to do from the beginning. And I looked over to, 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 to Greg and, I, and while Ringo was there, I said, well, what about the Court of the Crimson King? And Greg was like, oh, that, no, that'll never work. No, no, <laughs> no one would ever remember. Hmm. I said, dude, I'm a huge fan, and that was class- that's true rock and roll history. I mean, uh, I mean uh, Ian McDonald, it, it was one of those times that, you know, if you were, into, if you were conscious I mean, that was like, I hate to say, but it was such a drug-influenced record. It was like, it had such heavy connotations, but Mm -hmm. The Court of the Crimson King was such a trip. And he, I won't say he fought tooth and nail, but it was, it took a, it took a little bit of heavy lifting to convince him to let's try it. So we try it, and Ringo does his first three songs, and the first song after Ringo's video goes, and now I'd like to introduce Greg Lake. And all of a sudden, the whole audience is like almost in tears <laughs> because anybody who knew anybody who was around that time, it was, a, it, I, I pat myself on the back. That was one of the best calls of my career with Ringo because people loved it. And it was, it was just the one that nobody was going to call. So with that said, I guess the short answer is Ringo is the ultimate. He wants to make the greatest sounding band ever. And, Everybody gets their pick. It's like we, 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 everyone got three songs. And, of course, we want to pick the highest chart position songs. But on that, in that case, I said, this is a song that people who are the real fans are going to freak out. And uh, it worked. I mean, Edgar always did Frankenstein and Free Ride. And there was, I'm, not, I'm trying to think if there was a third song because there might have been five front people in that band. But um, you pick your highest chart positions. Uh, and I hope I'm not going too far off the subject, but Ringo is the most present human being I've ever known in my life. John was the same way when I worked with John for a short time. They were so aware. It's like they had this like 360 vision. You didn't know how they saw what was coming around from behind them, but as far as being in the moment on stage, that's just what, the, what, he, what Ringo is and what John was. So I oh. hope I kind of answered the question, Steve. You did. Thank you, Mark. Ken? I wanted to ask you, and actually I wanted to bounce a little bit off of what, what Steve said and what you just said, the process of picking the new members for the All-Stars, how exactly huh? does that work? They, the, the, a, a person uh, who is the agent, Dave Hart, has come to me for years now, and he'd come to me and say, uh, dude, we got to do this, we need to get that, we need to get a new guitar player. Ringo likes to keep it fresh. This, in fact, is the first time ever that the same four, uh, the same band has gone out for four separate tours ever. Ringo loves this band, but the process basically would be um, who would fit into the groove. Aside from the music, it has to be a, a personality thing because there have been a couple of clashes that I won't mention, but things do happen, and you have to realize that when you're dealing with a Beatle, I'll give you a. a, a Funny little example, nothing, nothing negative. Jack Bruce and Peter Frampton, we were all talking about, oh, we were on a plane heading to the next gig, and Jack mentioned, oh, I remember that record, I think we sold like 12 million, and Peter said, oh, we did 17 million on that, and we did 30 of it. And then, then they asked Ringo, and how many records do you think he, he saw? He goes, oh, half a billion. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, everybody's like, oh, okay, I'll go sit in the corner now, you know? <laughs> And what it is is you have to hang your ego up at the door. So you you bring the music, you have to fit in with the group, and 
the songs have to be fun. Ringo doesn't want to, you know, watch paint dry. He wants to get up there and have a great time. And as far as the, the, the choice of musicians, great songs, great attitude, and that's pretty much the criteria. I mean, there's not much more. If you think about it, when when we were kids, when we were younger in a band, you want to go hang out with guys who were cool. You wanted to play great music. All the bands I was ever in, I'd play covers. That's what we did as a kid. And then you grow up, you start writing material and realize how, how difficult it really is. Mm-hmm. But this is about, Ringo's about getting the best guys together to make the best sound for the best band. He's a, he, I remember one time he said, I'm just a drummer in the band. I said, you just happen to be the drummer of the greatest band ever, but that's beside the point. Mm. So, but uh, he's very, he's very much a band person and he's, Obviously, as you both know, as you've studied him or you've been so involved in his music, he's the greatest song drummer ever. Ever. I mean, there's nobody who played a song that did more. It's also, you got to give a little credit to that guy, John and Paul, for writing those incredible songs. Because those songs had to be dealt with a certain way because they were, they were little pieces of music. They were, little, uh, they were just... They were pieces of music, so there's to it. And Ringo just did them the ultimate service that they sounded like no other drummer would have ever played. So I agree, you know, and that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, I was going to say he knew how to compliment the song. Oh, absolutely. There was there was no one. There is no one like him. I, I don't believe so. Getting back to answering the question, did you did you kind of say that you you kind of filter who the new musicians would be? Do you help decide oh, that? Yeah, to some extent. To some extent, I mean, they'll, they'll once in a while they they throw uh, they throw a musician at me, and I just know that it was wrong, and I won't give any cases and points. But I, you have let's say let's say you have a nucleus. You have Ringo. You have Greg Bizanet, who I love, and for some time now Richard Page has been the bass player. So we needed a guitar player, uh, a keyboard player, or two guitars and a keyboard. And when they first mentioned Greg Raleigh. I'm like, I don't know. i, I got to think about this. And then I, I thought about it for a second. I thought these amazing, soulful songs being played by Steve Lucas. And I said, really? You had to think about that? <laughs> so that that just came together. There have been situations where I didn't think it would work, and it did. And there have been situations where I thought it might not be the best, and it wasn't. They're just hit and miss. I mean, they're, 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 that's, why, that's why some guys last for one tour and some guys have lasted six or seven tours huh well i just i wanted to comment about because you were mentioning greg lake before to me uh-huh. because I, I love great singers and to me roger hodgson mm-hmm. is one of the greatest uh, i love roger to have that tour with him and greg lake and howard jones and sheila e mm-hmm. uh yeah. you you would look at a list like that and say these musicians how could they connect there are different decades, uh, and, different and Andy, styles. Eddie and Hunter to that. Eddie and Hunter to that. Yeah. Said, what are you crazy? <laughs> in fact, it's funny you mentioned that because I did say that. I said, I don't think I don't know about this. And sure enough, we got together, and it was it was magic. It was really magic. You know, some some lineups look very strange on paper, but then you watch it, and it's mm-hmm. like it's it's amazing to combine in the court of the Crimson King with the glamorous life. I mean, <laughs> exactly. You, you, you couldn't, you know, you would think there's no way this could possibly happen. And you're absolutely right, Ken. It, it, it does take, it takes a while. And, uh, but um, it, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, some of the lineups, when I first heard them, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this guy really just wants to put a band together because he just wants to put this band out there. But what it comes down to, the more eclectic it was, the more bang for buck anybody came to see a show because you had five bands that you were hearing the, the creme de la creme, mm-hmm. getting 10, 10 or 12 Ringo songs, Beatle Ringo songs. Then he had two or three songs each of these other four musicians. It was like going to five concerts in one. And I'm sure everyone says that, or you felt the same way. Am I correct? Both of you, mm-hmm. Steve? Yeah. Ben? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I love all the lineups, but that's, that's the most memorable for me. I like eclecticism. You know, uh-huh. there, there are uh-huh. probably some people who prefer the Jack Bruce, Gary Brooker, Peter Frampton. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I love no, that I too. remember I remember that, uh, <laughs> Ken. And that that one has a big memory for me, as does the 
the you know the first bands with uh, Billy when Billy Preston was there. Oh yeah, uh, yeah man, no, but, but the, no, I'll, t- I'll really. tell you the one name that comes to mind, and you mentioned her just now was Sheila E. Uh-huh. That was her her two tours with her tours with the band were just amazing, and yeah. and I've been one. I keep hoping that at some point she's going to come back. Is there any chance that she might come back? Uh, I can't say that I know anything about Crystal Bull, but I don't think so. Okay. Because I think Greg Bizanet, basically, Greg and Ringo are so solid together. I've n- I don't know. What, I mean, Greg knows when Ringo accidentally hit his, uh, when he dropped a stick in, in a recording, if he ever did. Greg, Greg studies Ringo so, so precisely, and uh, Ringo loves Greg. And it's, it's a mutual thing. I, look, I, that doesn't mean what, what I could see happen someday, and uh, I don't think it's out of turn to speak, would be the best of the, the, the all of the All-Stars, or the best of the All-Stars, and have a band with, like, you know, three guitar players, have a Peter Frampton come back, have a, um, uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, Roger Hodgson, you mentioned the, there's some amazing musicians that have passed through this, this band. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, a, 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 a fair amount of them are no longer with us. From from Levon to, to Danko to, to Billy Preston, they, they all and John into us. I mean, the first band that I ever played with with Ringo was um, Zach Stark. He played drums. Uh, Randy Bachman, Mark mm-hmm. Farner, Felix Cavalieri, and unfortunately, John into us and Billy Preston, who were both passed. Right. Right. And, I, I remember. I remember that tour too. That was a great tour. You know, it, it, it's so difficult because like it's like children. You know, I have two sons, and I, you know, I, I love them both more than air, and you can't say you love one more than the, than the other. But there's certain things one will do, like, oh yeah, that was, I remember he did that. But you know, I, I'm, I've been with like nine different incarnations of this band, and the ones that stick out to me, I still have to say this current lineup for my own brothers is my favorite because the musicality is like nothing I've ever heard. People doing their homework. But I'm with you on the Jack Bruce uh, and Peter Frampton tour. I mean, I also got to play. I got to play the, the organ on Whiter Shade of Pale next to Gary Brooker every night. Mm. How much fun was I having? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then you talk about the same band with Sheila E. and and uh, Roger and and, um, and Howard Jones. Howard Jones played Carnival Nine, which has more synths and keyboards and stuff on two keyboards. A big one, big. Um, I forget what they call it, like a master keyboard, and a little Casio. He had a little Casio to extend like two octaves that he couldn't get on the other stuff. But the, he played everything, and she killed that. I remember watching her from behind stage one time, a silhouette on the on the scrim, right. mm-hmm. and it was like it was like watching uh, something out of the Muppets. It was insane, and that band that band too sticks out in my mind. So. If anything, uh, you know, what you're saying, it gives you a deeper appreciation for all the musicians in that band because you wouldn't associate Sheila E. with a song like Carnival 9. No kidding. You know, and and she nails it the same way Howard Jones Uh, nails it. That's the beauty of it all. And I I, I also think uh, the same thing with Edgar Winter with with his tours with the band. I mean, he was... Amazing. Yeah. Just just amazing. I mean, Edgar, Edgar is one of the true... I mean, he's one of the most talented human beings I've ever, ever met. I love him as a friend and as a player. He's, um, he's deep. He's just deep. He's got such a... And it, it's expensive. He's got the most incredible scope of music of anyone I know. He'll play, uh, he'll play bebop. He'll play uh, funk. He'll, he, he turned me on to this guy... Um, God, I can't... I can't uh, 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 um, Israel Holton, I think his name is. Tremendous gospel singer, and then then he'll turn around and play bebop, and then he'll turn around and play uh, in one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, when I was a kid, I saw White Trash open up for Emerson Lake and Palmer. Mm. White Trash killed the night. It was I'll never forget. I said, "How is that possible?" That, and then, then wah! I mean, between Edgar and Jerry Lacroix, it was like I wanted to be in that band. I wanted to have a band that had that type of intensity. And um, look, Edgar, you have to you have to kind of bow. I'm I'm I'm, doing, I'm like almost like Namaste. It's like <laughs> he's he's an incredible human being and a gift. He's really a gift to have as a friend. Mm. 
So wow. I, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, as we're talking here, I, I mean, I appreciate Ringo mostly uh, from as a friend from this whole thing started because of him and three of the last from Liverpool. But as I'm speaking to you, the introductions that he's made for me and the, the, the bridges to, to, to lifelong friends that he's made, uh, I, I could never have, I would never have had these relationships without him. Never. Mm-hmm. And I'm, 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 I'm more grateful for his friendship and for what he's given me in that respect than, than anything. I mean, again, you talk about common bond. This, these things come out because of that. It's, uh, it's just that. Yeah, you've met a lot of great musicians through the All-Stars. Oh, yeah. You do, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. I think if I don't ask this question, a lot of people are going to say, why didn't you ask? But I have to ask about the night that Paul McCartney surprised everybody at Chase Stadium because I remember watching that and hearing, hearing the news right after it happened and then seeing the video and hearing the screams, and it was amazing. Yeah. Can you talk well, a little bit about that, Mark? Of course. Yeah, I'd love to. He, uh, we didn't know if he was going to make it because he flew in from London. He was on a flight, and um, we had, like, a, I think, an 11.30 curfew or something. We, we, we had to be done at a certain time. And for that matter, the set was going on so long. We only had so many songs prepared for that night. We were done, and we had played a couple of nights before, and it was about 140 degrees. It was stifling, and we were all melting on stage. And we came up for the first encore, and I'm like, the plane just landed. I'm like, oh, man, the plane just landed. He'll never get here. As it turns out, the plane landed, and they got from the tarmac. They had driven him straight out of there through customs like it didn't matter. He had the, uh, he had the hop nose, we call the Mona Lisa, with him, and he just came directly backstage as we cleaned, drying up for the second encore. He fixed his black tie and came up. It was like within... 15, maybe 20 minutes from the time the, the, the plane landed. And it was like, is he here? We don't know. Is he here? We don't know. We, we thought he's going to, we knew he wanted to try to make it. And he landed and it was all over. It was, uh, it was incredible. It was just incredible. And then Billy, the ultimate, I mean, you talk about total class, closing Shea Stadium. He packed two nights of over 120,000 people. And what does he do? He tells Paul McCartney, no, you close this set. Who, who would do that for the mm-hmm. gentleman? Mm-hmm. It, was, it was one of, I'll never forget that because it was the last song he played at Chase Stadium, and it was Paul closing it out. Uh, it, 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 it blows my mind to this day how that happened. Those are two people that I wish would, would uh, you know, do more work together, especially in oh. the studio. It would be a dream come true. There's, so, there's a lot studio, of similarities, I, you know. I would love to have the two of them do like a, what, what Billy and Ellen did. I mean, Billy and Paul would be insane. Mm-hmm. That would be, to me, that would be like, uh, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to do. I'd to play with Paul's band as well. I love, I love Abe, and I'm good friends with Wick. So, uh, it, you know, you never know. Mm. Um, we'll I just wanted to ask, when it came to the All-Stars, when you had rehearsals, when you were ironing out the songs that you were going to do on each tour, were there any songs that were big hits and you thought, oh, definitely, we're going to go with this. And for some reason, it didn't work? Not really. I mean, uh, certain people would try to rearrange their songs, and I'd hate it. But that's just my choice. That's my, my opinion. But, uh, you know, we, we constantly ask Ringo, would you play this song? Would you play Octopus's Garden? Would you play uh, All My My? Nah, I'm bored. I don't want to. They keep saying about Octopus's Garden. He goes, there's Yellow Submarine. And there's this. He goes, what do they want to think? I live on the water. That's well, just, you know. But um, no, I can't remember any song that didn't work. That was a flop. Hmm. Okay. Um, there were, I mean, there were songs that, that we didn't know. They talk about like little gems that all of a sudden we hadn't thought of and then just came out and they, they worked. I'm trying to think of any in particular. I remember when uh, Eric Cartman was in the band who has short lived, but Jack Bruce and he had their moments because Go All The Way had a song, as Jack said, you have a chord for every damn word you sing, and he's going on and on. But as it turns out, we did Go All The Way, and the crowd went nuts. So it was a three-minute song, but the people absolutely loved it. And that, you know, I was a Raspberry fan, but I didn't think it was going to get the reception it did. And, uh, say la vie. Hey, a lot of Beatles fans are Raspberry fans. So oh, absolutely. I mean, listen to go all the way. I mean, it's like one, it, it, it sounded like one, it sounded like a, a like bad finger. It had a sense of like it, it had that it had all the right elements. 
it, it was, it, you know, it was like, don't bore us, get to the chorus. It was like, you, like nine seconds into the song, you're just like, go all the way. Uh-huh. You know, it's, like, it's crazy. It's crazy <laughs> how much of a hit that was. Are you going to make any uh, set changes um, for the upcoming, uh, for the summer tour, Mark? If I have my way, uh, I'm going to swap out one of Todd's songs. Okay. <laughs> because cause I'm a fan of where Todd came from, but I'm not going to say any more than that. <laughs> okay. How about Ringo? Uh, Ringo, I'm trying to get him to do All My My. Uh, I hope he'll do like 16 again. He wants to do I'm the Greatest, but I think personally, <clears throat> I'd rather hear All My My. Uh, I'd, r- I'd love to have, have him do I'd love to have him do Octopus's Garden because I don't think he's ever done that except for the Roundheads. Mm-hmm. So it would be it would be cool. Um, and the rest of the band, I think maybe Luke would like to do a different song than Africa, but uh, who knows? We'll see. We'll see. But I definitely have my my my, my mind set on one song by Todd, and it's okay. actually uh, <laughs> before he called himself Todd. In fact. <laughs> so that should give you an idea how far back I'm going. Is there a chance that Ringo's album will be out before the summer tour? Or uh, do you know? Very possibly. I know. Uh, I believe Steve, uh, Luke, Luke, and, and Ringo are writing together, which I'm really anxious to hear. I'm yeah, really looking forward to hearing that. It could be. I mean, Ringo doesn't waste a lot of time. As Ringo said, if you're not in the room, you're not in the record. He, he's a firm believer in getting it done. You know, he, he doesn't. He, he doesn't think just like a. It's not like watching an elephant give birth. He wants to get it done. So. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your singing because obviously, you know, we're we're getting a taste of it on the new on the new C D here and it's just so wonderful to hear you I mean your your voice is not only strong but it's just it's so durable. You do a very well, strong R and B voice, a great ballad voice and all. And a lot of people they know that you've done background vocals through the years with Billy and with Foreigner and with the All Stars. And when I when I got a taste of it during the the last few tours, when you're backing up Steve Lukather in Africa, and Rosanna, tell me about your singing. I mean, do you have wh- who are the people that that you emulated as a singer, if any? Um, did you uh, always want to try to be like a, an R and B singer? Look, I love Wilson Pickett. Uh, I love uh, Stevie Winwood, Paul Rogers, Lou Graham. I don't think I could shine any of their shoes, but those are the greatest singers that I, I, I love. Um, Levi uh, Stubbs from the Four Tops. I, I always grew up loving R and B. I love, I just love the soul. I mean, I don't con- I, I, I could never sing soft and quiet. I could, I, I, my 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 younger sister said, "You're a black man trapped in a white man's body." So, well, thank you. So it's a, it could be a lot <laughs> worse. But uh, I've always had, I've always leaned towards R and B, and a lot of the record, I believe, uh, and I proudly call it a record. Is that it's a lot of a lot of emotional R and B, um, soulful. I mean, look, Hendrix. I mean, these are the people who I love, uh, and my e- even how I play saxophone. It's got to do with that. It's not. It's not. It's never been about jazz. It's been about rock and roll and and soul. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I I think that's a compliment to say that I have an R and B voice. But I thank you for that. You know, you you could probably point to. I mean, there's so many great songs that Billy Joel has given us, but there's a lot that are very strong R and B. Are are there certain songs? Do you do you like a lot of? I mean, obviously you love Billy's catalog, but the ones that mm-hmm. that I kind of point to as being R and B esque, "Until the Night," something like that. Um, Until the I, Night. Well, my favorite Billy Joel song, as far as his, one of my favorite Billy Joel vocal performances, has to be "All About Soul." Oh yeah, <laughs> which that, is a killer vocal. I mean, she works for me at night. Nice. He's got this like undertone, and it's so convincing. It's so passionate. Um, I love that song. Until the night is another one of those. It's like the Righteous Brothers, right? So you have this sense of black music, R and B music, and uh, I mean, Billy be the first one to tell you. I mean, this, Billy's favorite band when he was a kid. I mean, the band that I mean, aside from, aside from the Beatles, was the Rascals. Mm-hmm. And the Rascals were the first blue-eyed soul band. They were the bunch of Italian guys from the Bronx, and uh, I think they're all from the, in, in that area, singing rock and roll, but soul. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, the the, the, the record that we, I mean, the greatest, <laughs> without sounding so nostalgic and old, my favorite year for music, when I was a kid, I was 14 in 1967, and if you remember those quintessential records that came out, this, these are seminal records, Sergeant Pepper, Are You Experienced, the Collections album by by, uh, by the Rascals, 
whiter shade of pale, and fresh cream. That was like that was like a very very fertile year as far as growth. I mean, I, I think I'm trying to think when Santana came out. Was that about '68? I think so. Yeah, I think so. so. Right around that time, and there was all this amazing music coming out. And if you think about the five records that I just mentioned, that was like a shotgun. Now we got to pinpoint and pigeonhole songs into oh. Uh, we can't play that. It's not, it's not. It doesn't fit the format. Right. There was no format. They were guys who had a lot of nerve, or not, no, had great ears, and weren't afraid to, to play something they loved. And there's a big difference, unfortunately. Uh, again, I, want, I don't want to critique or, or criticize the music business, but you don't uh, get that now. You can critique it all you want with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're preaching to the choir. But, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, you uh, really are because I'm. I feel the same way, Mark. Uh, I feel like. Well, I, I feel like a lot of entertainment in general, movies especially, are all kind of focus group kind of situations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it really is, really uh, having grown, I, I mean, you were talking about 67, I mean, that was a great period, 68 too. Um, mm-hmm, actually, the yeah. whole the whole middle 60s was absolutely, just absolutely astound, astounding as far as music uh, how about the How about the Young Bloods? Yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah. Just, I mean, really, it was a time of peace and love. It was a, it was a great time. It was so fertile. And I'll tell you, uh, with that, with that point, uh, Steve, Jimmy Braylauer pointed to me. He said, "He said, buddy, we need to do a record for people who are not being served. Great music. I mean, people from forty-five to sixty-five. Where do they go for music? They hear mm-hmm. the, I hate to say it, but they're hearing the same music over and over. And I have very dear friends who work in DJs in, their, in those formats, and they love my record." but they can't get past the gatekeeper to play it. So the crazy thing is I, I really believe that Jimmy and I put together a record that if, if it gets heard, people are going to want to buy it. I, I think I want, I, I mean, I dig my record. I dig the fact that I have liner notes, that I put uh, credits and did the whole thing. And that, that I mean, I remember the first time, well, my favorite Hendrix record is probably Axis. I remember the first time I opened that up and saw the picture in the middle, and I, I read every note, and who, Eddie Kramer was doing this, and was recorded at the, at the record plant. It was insane. I knew, uh, it, uh, it was just one of those things that you knew, and you dove into a record. People don't dive into it. I mean, people at this point, I hate to say people, for the most part, music is something that's done while you're either driving or on the computer doing something else. Mm-hmm. The, the experience of music and I'm hoping, I, I, I hope I don't sound arrogant, but I, I hope this record is something that people actually sit down. Because a couple of people said they put, they put the record on, and again, I keep referring to it as the record. They, they put it on, and they listened from start to finish. And it was like a 40-minute trip. It was like, because the song is moved in different ways. I like that. I mean, I remember putting on a record, the only time you'd stop was when to turn it over. Right. That was it. Well, Mark... It was almost like a break because it was like... You know, so you should, Mark. You should have listened to the last few shows that Steve and I have done because we've been talking about radio and and how different it is now. And um, it's more about marketing today than it is about the music, and about mm-hmm. the feel of the music and the experience of the music. And that's not to say that there isn't good music that's out there, but it's just you are complaining and and rightfully so about niche radio today and mm-hmm. where do you place certain artists? And it's very difficult, especially for veteran artists, to get airplay. So we've been talking oh. about that for the last few uh, few shows, yeah. And uh, well, this this fits right in with the conversation. And you well, know, I'll tell you if if you wouldn't mind. I mean, if you have a moment uh, in the future, if you want to talk to somebody, I'd love for you to, to to speak to and to meet my producer Jimmy Braylar. He would he would he would be a great guest. <laughs> Listen, I Mark, mean, he's got this depth. He, he's wonderful. And if you if you're interested in spending a half an hour with him, you guys you guys should know him. Uh, his background, his insight. Uh, he worked at, at Atlantic Records for years, and he would come. Look, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to th- throw stones too much, but he would, he would hear great music, and it's like, oh no, it's not going to fit. You know, uh-huh. where do you go? So, but he, right. he'd be, I believe he'd be a great guest. And uh, hey, hopefully, hopefully this record gets heard because it's, it's my life. I won't say like, you know, I'm not going to be impoverished, but. I really would love for this record to at least see the light of day and give it a shot. You know, I'll, I'll leave you with one more thing because Jimmy keeps his, his words resonating in my brain. 
everything starts with Buddy. Buddy, did you hear Bruce Springsteen's South by Southwest uh, keynote speech? Are you familiar with the one I'm talking about two years ago? Are you familiar, Steve? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Okay, if you get a chance, when you, and, and, and this is this is just religion, man. Bruce Springsteen gave the, the, the keynote speech at South by Southwest. I think it's two years ago now. He talked about how the difference between current young people making music, in other words, if you own a computer, you're you're a producer. If you own a camera, you're a photographer. You know, I mean, if you have a guitar, you're a musician. He said, when we were kids, we didn't dream in our wildest dreams that we'd ever be even close to shine the shoes of these great people. And he cited Eric Eric Burton as his influence for everything he ever wrote. We got to get out of this place. Was born to run. Everything that he ever played and ever wrote was something from an animal song. And it's really poignant to hear that because not enough people are willing to do the thousands of hours. How many how many shows do you think the Beatles did before they played the Ed Sullivan show? Six? Mm-hmm. Oh. Thousand? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? These, I mean, Ringo well, tells me stories about how a windshield was blown out and they were driving through Germany for five hours with a the, the hole in their windshield. They 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 did everything. They they did all their they did all their hard work. Forget the the ten thousand hours. That was for real. Those guys, I mean, I'm reading uh, in time now uh, Mark Levinson's book. Have you read that? I'm sure. You mean Mark Lewison's book? Yeah. I mm-hmm. think it's Levinson. But Mark Levinson. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that book. Yeah, right. Well, have you, you okay. read it, right? Yes. Yeah. We both it's read just it. It's just incredible to, to see where these guys, how much of their blood and their, 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 their lives they put into this. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an accident when they hit the Ed Sullivan show and every eyeball in America... And that there was no crime when that happened, right? It was that it was just that time. But uh, you know, I, I hope I don't go too far off on tangents. But when you talk, when you ask me about you know music and about what I think, mm-hmm. it's almost like uh, I hope you have your seatbelt on because it's going to be an e-ticket ride. Oh, I think but, that would make a that that should be a separate show. And and anytime well, you want to talk about it, because I wanted to discuss with you myself your feelings about the music industry today because you've been in it for a long time you've seen the good and the bad you know we're living in a digital age now and things are so different right. from the way radio used to be radio is so niche right. oriented now and like mm-hmm. i was saying it's more about marketing it's more about knowing who your audience is who your demographics right. are all that stuff has got to be put into all the thought behind it instead of just playing the music and enjoying it and right. experiencing it do you think we're better off or worse off for that reason uh, I, th- I think it's a double-edged sword, honestly, Ken, because the technology, technologically speaking, we have the ability to do pretty much anything, but unfortunately, pretty much anything can go on the radio, or pretty much anything has the same shot. And w- w- there's a level of mediocrity that I don't like at all. Mm-hmm. There's some, if I could be so bold, there's some crap out there that in the 60s would never have been played. I mean... <laughs> And we're going back at a time when Country Joe and the Fish were playing, doing these trippy songs, but it's just some sappy crap that would never have seen the light of day. And again, it's this race for uh, the race for the bottom, is it, or the race for like you know the the the, the, the most lowest common denominator? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm not up for that. I, I really believe I'm telling you, we could have had this record out over a year ago, but Jimmy would not allow it. And uh, I'll say it again. You have to get Jimmy on the show. You will. You would love his insight. I, I just have to see if I could curtail his cynicism to some extent, so we, <laughs> so we don't we don't totally alienate ourselves. But the guy is so incredibly knowledgeable, and everything they can about his production, I give it up to him. I, I, I raise my glass to him. Uh, this this record would have been a good record, and I really, without in all in all humility, I can say this to me is a great record because of his effort. So. Uh, Okay. I don't know when you might think about doing that, but um, I'd like to have both of you guys back on together. I think that would be a great, a I great would love idea. That. In fact, what we could do is I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, what we'd love, what I'd love to do would be to have possibly the two of us out of Jimmy's house in Long Island and maybe play some. If we could play little snippets of different things that he's done and with with where germs came from from the songs and how savvy this guy is. Hmm. I mean. He, I mean, his, I, I just barely scratched the surface with his credits. I mean, the two of us have played on geez, hundreds of millions of records, honestly. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of millions of records that, we, that have been sold with our name on it. 
is there a way we could consider doing this again? Steve, Steve would be a pleasure. Ken, sure. Let me let me ask one more question about the album because yeah, I was going to. Of course. Gonna, of course. Um, are you going to uh, Are you going to do besides the cutting room gig? Are you going to do any other promotional things for the album? Absolutely. I'm doing a, what I'm doing is every time we play in a big city, uh, I'm going to call it my Acela tour because the Acela train goes from like Boston to Connecticut to New York to New Jersey to Philadelphia to DC. And we're playing, uh, we'll be playing Fenway Park, we'll be playing National Park in D.C., we'll be playing a park at Lincoln, I think it's Lincoln Field in Philly. What I want to do is, every one of those cities, I want to go in with a band and have them get on a train uh, the night after or the night, be- and probably two nights before or the night after. Probably the night after Billy's show would be the best because uh, there's, there's so much stuff going on before. But I want to go in there and go into radio stations. I want to go and do live stuff. In fact, uh, you gentlemen know uh, Mike Marone, right? I know the name from um, um, XM from, and Sirius. Yes. Mike has championed this record. He's played five or six songs already from this record. He loves this record. And he wants me to come down and do a show with the band down there. And I'll do a gig in, in D.C. at the same time. I'll go do a gig uh, in Philly. So the, the short answer to your question, to your question Steve, is, Yes, I will be doing. Uh, I will be doing a bunch of promotional gigs. I can't call it a tour because it's impossible for me to say I'm going to just put a, a whole machine together and do a tour because of the fact that I'm working with Billy. And again, that's the greatest again the champagne problem, as Nils would say, to have because while Billy's out doing his thing, I'm able to do some radio, some press, and uh, God willing, get get out there and play in front of some people. I mean, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful vehicle being on this tour. We're playing, uh, I mean, we'll be playing a couple of gigs to like 65, 70,000 people. And if a slight awareness could be generated from my record, I'd be one of the happiest people on this earth. Well, okay. we wish you the best of luck, Billy. Uh, uh, Mark, Billy? Uh, Billy. <laughs> well, Mark, 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 I, we, we Mark. wish you the best of luck, Mark. It's a wonderful record, and anyone that hasn't heard it, Ken and I have both reviewed it, and we both love it, and we both give well, it a, I, a high recommendation. I thank you both so much for, for your kindness, and uh, you know what? There are people who are still listening, and that makes me very, very happy. <laughs> so then we'll figure out a time when we can do this again. Mark, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, we will have you back again soon, and hopefully with Jimmy. You got it. And again, gentlemen, Beatles songs, the things you said today, one of my favorite ever, and you know that. God bless you, gentlemen. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. This has been great. This was, it was. It was. That was a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed that immensely. Yeah. Great to have Mark Rivera with us. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. Thanking you all for listening. And we'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today saying thank you, Mark Rivera, and we will see you next time. <laughs>